Welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I'm so glad that you have come along. And if you are interested in leadership in the church, leadership in the church, I think you'll find this series of episodes where I have nine interviews with candidates for an interim bishop position in the Global Methodist Church. I think you'll find this series interesting. I also will have an interview with somebody who has authored the a, another plan that's being presented to the convening conference of the Global Methodist Church later in September. So we'll get a little bit of both sides sides as we have this series coming out basically in the month of September as we approach that convening conference. And I'm a Global Methodist Church elder, and I'll be a delegate at the general conference. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens as a result of that convening conference. I wanted to highlight that part of the reason my audience might be interested in this is because you all are probably engaged in thinking about what leadership looks like in the life of the church. And that's a part of why I'm here in the first place, is I serve as the president of Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And we do that through bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. We have several people who audit our courses. We have our largest enrollment ever this fall with more than 700 students enrolled in academic programs. We have a Wesley Institute, which isn't an academic program, but it is a program where seminary professors teach every book of the Bible or seminary professors teach a, a host of theological disciplines across a nine-month period. We'd love for you to find out more about that at wbs.edu. I'm also thankful to True Charity, the True Charity Network, who's a sponsor of today's podcast, and they help people who are feeling overwhelmed, churches that are feeling overwhelmed by the responsibilities that come with ministering to those in need. They suggest, and I believe them, I believe this to be true, that God calls his church to care for the orphan, widow, sojourner, and the poor. But building an effective mercy ministry is tough. How do you know if you're making a real difference? How do you build ministries that support the inherent dignity of people made in God's image, allowing those in need to be a part of their own solution? And how do you equip your congregation to build life-changing relationships? Join a nationwide movement where God's people are banding together to answer these questions. The True Charity Network is a coalition of over 200 churches and nonprofits in 31 states building and refining their ministries together. Consider joining their network as you pursue dignifying relational ministry with those in need. Join the True Charity Network today at truecharity.us slash join truecharity.us slash join and pay attention at the end of this podcast for a short interview I have with one of their executives. Now I'm excited to present this content to you as we hear from these nine bishops. It'll come in successive episodes, but I'm thankful to them for wanting to be interviewed and looking forward to sharing this with you. God bless you. Hi friends. I am so glad to welcome to the podcast, my friend, Carolyn Moore. Carolyn, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Andy. So such a pleasure to be with you. And of course, we've already had you on this podcast, as is the case um, with a few of the other delegates. When you were, uh, how appropriate is it? Like when you were talking about the fact your book, When Women Lead, and here we are talking about this opportunity <laughs> that God's presented for you to be a candidate for the Episcopacy in the Global Methodist Church. What a, what a healthy thing for our movement to know that um, we're looking at gifts and call so much more than we're looking at um, issues that have plagued other denominations and other seasons. And I'll just, I can't help but, I think that more than people in the Global Methodist Church will be watching this podcast. And you know that many people in my audience are connected to the Salvation Army and other traditions like the Free Methodist, Wesleyans, Nazarenes, and the like. But uh, we we just spent some time sharing it, the fact that you just shared a large gathering at the Salvation Army at Lake June, yeah. Alaska. So I was yeah. I was so glad to see the Salvation Army has found Carolyn Moore. It's such a blessing. Wow. Oh, and that Carolyn Moore has found the Salvation Army. I love those folks. What a great organization. And I I don't think I have been at a gathering where the the conversation around Wesleyan theology was more prevalent. It was mm. just a beautiful time. I'm really grateful for the week I spent with them. I'll spend uh, another week, uh, I think another couple of days next week, maybe with their leaders. And uh, then I get to be with the recovery centers in spring. So I'm just oh, really great. happy. Yeah. Great. Oh, you're going to love that. And, um, yeah. and I'm so thankful for that for folks. Look, look, this is a part of what's exciting about this moment. And even my coming to Wesley Biblical Seminary was a part of, of sensing the way various 
evangelical Wesleyan denominations are coming together. And I think even the nature of, of this conversation is, is a part of that, is that the fruit of this, I'm a revival, um, this opportunity or this, this time where God's at work is the emergence of the global Methodist church. And so, exactly. yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm excited for that. I'll, I'll let, go ahead and comment on that let, before we get into the, the technical interview. <laughs> Well, one of the things that inspires me most about Salvation Army is that they are present in 130 countries. Yes. So when the word that leads in our movement is global, and and that gets me so excited to think that we don't have to just con constrain ourselves to the um, to the, uh, the 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 areas of the world that have been grandfathered in. Yes. The Philippines, Africa, Europe, the United States. But we can actually reach beyond and consider how we might um, how we might partner with or um, or event be you know really send evangelists out into missionaries out into areas of the world that have Methodists already like yes. India like South America I can just go on and on and list areas of the world that have uh, movements and denominations that are that are Wesleyan in their yes. rootedness, but they're just waiting, just waiting for partnership. Yeah. Amen. So yeah. Exciting. Like that's where WBS is. And just it, we went to every annual conference that we could. And one of the things that you yeah, people might not have seen as those convening conferences were happening is that the vendors I forget. I, I don't like being called a vendor, but sometimes it's just what we sponsors, what whatever we are. Yeah. Yeah. But we just it was great to get together with these, these folks and uh, mission agencies. And I think it's going to be more healthy going forward to have third party groups. And this is part of what what is it, the opportunity for the Global Methodist Church is to find partners, global partners yes. who are able to work in this way. Absolutely. What, what's not to prevent us? from linking arms with anyone anywhere on the globe that is theologically aligned with us and has a heart for the ones that do not yet know. I mean, Amen. gosh, how could it, can't give me some, that's, good. that's the part of all of this that gets me most excited, Andy. I, every time I, when I close my eyes and think, I think about a whole world of people who are just waiting for a fair account of the gospel. Amen. Well, and that's anticipating one of my questions. So I, I sent all the candidates the same questions. and I'll do my best. I, I'm certainly going to just dovetail off here occasionally into mm -hmm. other subjects, but I want to make sure we get through these as best we can. So, Carolyn, my very first question, and it has a timer attached to it. So I would love for you to give a two minute version of how you came to Christ. And I am going to use a timer. So three, two, one, go. All right. I was raised in a culturally Christian home, and that meant that we said a blessing before our meals, and at least a few of us went to church every Sunday. I'm the last of six, and so usually it was my mom and one or two kids who go to church most Sundays, but that was the extent of my spiritual formation in my early childhood. When I was 11, I was um, given the, I was given an invitation by a neighborhood friend to go to UMYF. So I went, and that was the beginning for me. When I was 12 at a mission trip in Blairsville, Georgia, uh, I was just suddenly confronted with the Holy Spirit and gave my life to Jesus, accepted the truth of the gospel. When I was 13, in a very mystical experience, I sensed a call into the ministry. Okay. Nobody in my world had ever seen a woman in ministry. And so that wasn't exactly affirmed as I moved through high school. And by the time I got to college, I'd watered it down. And when I watered down my call, I watered down my faith. So I kind of walked away by the end of college from my faith altogether. And it was I was in my late 20s, 28, 29 years old, when I finally came back to faith through the uh, through Bible study fellowship. I was okay. just so grateful. And I literally saw the the words of the bible jump off the page at me it became alive i had never experienced that kind of reading of the bible before and, and it just came off the page at me and i gave my life to christ again and when i my faith came back my call came back mm. amen that was great oh you even had 20 seconds to spare <laughs> so i'll just say i love jesus i love jesus for the next 20 seconds there you go i love it <laughs> Okay, so my last time question, people are going to say, oh, Andy, why are you doing these? Why are you time? But I just, I wanted to get this because honestly, 
these first two questions could take the entirety of our time together. Oh, so my goodness, just throwing yeah. that, particularly this one. So now you get three minutes, three minutes or less. You can you can do less. Um, of an overview of what makes a Wesleyan Christian a Wesleyan Christian. Yeah, that one could take a lot longer than three minutes. Um, I'll give you four things. Okay. I, I, there's got to be more, but I'll give you four. I think, yeah. first of all, I really appreciate Kevin Watson for introducing me to the term audacious optimism. Mm. Ryan Danker also refers to Methodism as fundamentally an optimistic faith. Mm. And I think our optimism is rooted in our systematic understanding of grace, prevenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace, and an entire sanctification. And um, because we because we emphasize the role of grace yeah. and trust that God can save us even to the uttermost, that God is coming after us Amen. like the hound of heaven, even before we know his name, Amen. Um, that we believe every person uh, can, not just can be saved, but has the right to be saved. Um, we are we are an optimistic faith, and I don't know about you, Andy, but when I hear a Methodist preach, I I can I can hear it. There's a distant yeah. difference. There is an optimism that comes through. So I would say entire saying, uh, excuse me, grace would be the first thing that sort of leads then to um, to evangelism. Mm -hmm. uh, we are we are an evangelistic faith. Our charge is to spread scriptural holiness throughout the land. Amen. Uh, and so um, I think I, I think I would say we're not just an evangelical denomination we are I, I really want us to think of ourselves not just as evangelical but as evangelistic that it is mm. every person's charge mm. to share the faith that we've been given to share that gift with others so that they might know too that jesus christ is lord of all mm. amen um so we're evangelistic the third thing i would say is um is, is that real specific emphasis on entire sanctification yes. i'm gonna um i'm gonna quote again from my brother Kevin Watson, who's taught me so much, taught all of us really so much sure, about this, sure. that that um, entire sanctification is our unique, uh, it's, it's our unique contribution to the body of Christ. And if we are not emphasizing that uh, that doctrine of entire sanctification, we're taking up a needless place in the body of Christ. That's pretty yeah, harsh, sure. but I think that's a good eye eye opening statement that we we actually have a responsibility for teaching that we not just that we can be saved, but we can be saved to the uttermost. Amen. Amen. So, and, and I would say, even if you don't actually believe you personally can ever be entirely sanctified. Whether you think it's possible or not is not so much the issue for me as are you pointed in that direction? Do you actually think you can be made perfect in love in this life, which is what yes. entire sanctification is, not perfectionism, but being made perfect in love in this life. If you think that you can, if it's possible, just head in that direction yeah, and you're yeah. more likely to get there. And how many, how many seconds do I have? Oh, uh, none. <laughs> oh, okay, 15. I'll give you 15. All right. Connectionalism. Amen. That okay. one comes from that one comes from uh David Watson. And uh he would say that he would say that connectionalism defines our organizational structure. There you go. Oh, you got it right there. 15 seconds. I, I honestly I was very disappointed, Carolyn, because I looked at when you said how much time do I have, I looked down and the clock was literally turning. You know, to three minutes. So there, there you go. Uh, I'm not going to be too legalistic, but I'm not going to be too perfectionate. I'm moving on to perfection. How about there that? There you go. There you go. So like, I, I was going to follow up on one thing there. Um, and I like, I like you say, say, and I want to be, and there's another question coming later about evangelism, evangelistic. Um, and, yeah. and the GMC, and I think you've been a part of various, various forms of leadership, with Wesleyan Covenant Association, going into the yeah. GMC. But um, there, there's conversation about, um, using the term evangelical. And I, in general, just because I'm a historian, like the thought of using evangelical because I think of it through the lens of David Bevington in that tradition. And, and, and I, I think historically what it is, is helpful. But there are times where I don't use the word because it's not as effective and some people see it as a political party. And so I, I, in our country, it might not be the case other places, but do you, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I appreciate the emphasis, make event evangelicalism needs to be about evangelism and the GMC needs to do that too. But what's your thoughts on just even using the word evangelical? 
I have no problem with it. I'm with you that we that, that we don't we don't shy away from a term just because it has um, it has taken on some cultural baggage. What we do is we we teach people here's the proper use of that term, good, and good. evangelical in the in its proper use means I am evangelistic. I believe every person has the right to hear a fair account of the gospel, and it is my personal responsibility to offer that fair account of the gospel. Uh, the only reason I don't, and a few minutes ago when I said that, the only reason I say I want to emphasize us as evangelistic rather yeah. than evangelical is that I do think evangelical kind of slides into a, um, I don't know, just a categorical slot and we can miss the personal call yeah. that is attached to it. I'm not just an evangelical. I am pers a person who is an evangelist. I'm actually literally an evangelist right now. My, my, um, uh, my title right now, or my, uh, I'm trying, I can't think of the word. Uh, anyway, I am, I am at my church. My title is evangelist in residence. Okay. And I am gotcha. charged with being an evangelist for this, for the cause of the gospel in my church and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and if you, if those of you who don't know Carolyn, if this is your first time hearing from her, well, you can go back to the More to the Story podcast and you can hear about Mosaic, but also at the GMC website, there's um there's an interview that's done where there's a couple other questions answered there. You should be able to find Carolyn's story about the church where she's serving now as an evangelist, formerly as like a founding pastor. So right. um just encourage you all to check that out. Um, Carolyn, one of the things is interesting, and, and I've gone through this too in this year, as I now sit in the, the seat as president of Wesley Biblical Seminary, but really for me, the first call and the primary call was to apply. Um, and so you were nominated and you cho you have chosen to accept um, this opportunity to be nominated to be a two-year bishop in the GMC. So why did you answer that call? That's a great question. And it takes a little bit of history. Um, for years, I have been very interested in the idea of an, of an Episcopal leader, a bishop, Mm -hmm. as a spiritual leader, primary yes. spiritual leader. I served as the vice chair and then the chair of the Wesleyan Covenant Associations. I was with the WCA at its inception and served in one of those two roles for seven of the last eight years. And somewhere along the way, a few years ago, someone first mentioned that as we're, as we're shaping the the role of bishop in this new movement that we're forming. Can we think of it as a spiritual leader? And I know I should have had that thought before then, <laughs> but it really came to me as yeah. a brand new idea. And I yeah, can yeah. say, I don't know that we've had great role models in that. I, that's not to slam anybody else. It's just to say, I, I don't think we've had great role models of bishop as spiritual leader. But I just became extremely interested in that idea. I remember standing in, in a colleague's kitchen one day just years ago saying, man, can you imagine how that could change our whole understanding of leadership? If we really begin to think of, of, of leadership at every level, from mm -hmm. the lay speaker to the, to the local pastor, to the ordained elder, to the bishop, uh, to every leader as spiritually grounded first, yes. first. And um, but especially in that role of bishop, especially that. So I thought about it really um, theoretically and um, and just, just kind of dreaming with everybody else what that role could be. I certainly never thought of it as a role for me personally, because I don't have the credentials if we're thinking traditionally. I've served two churches in 26 years. Um, both of them, I planted congregations. I, I planted a congregation within a larger church, and then I, for the last 21 years, I've been the founding and lead pastor of Mosaic. That's my ministry life. I have planted churches that served people who fall through the cracks of more traditional congregations. That's been my role. Mm -hmm. I've never served as a district superintendent, except for six months in this year as a presiding elder with the okay. GMC. I've never served as a delegate in a general or, or jurisdictional conference. Uh, I, I have served uh, here and there in the United Methodist Church in uh, committees or district assignments. But, you know, I've been tagged as a conservative for a long time. And so those roles didn't really fall to me. Mm. So I really didn't sense that I had the credentials for this. But what I have done as the as the chair and the vice chair of the WCA and 
as an activist in our new movement is I have written and thought and spoken and uh, dreamed a lot with others about what it could look like. And so whether or not my gifts line up, um, I really do have a great, a real vested interest in seeing the role of Episcopal leader become that as, as primary, a spiritual leader, using the gifts of apostle and prophet and evangelist. Mm -hmm. Three gifts, I think, that we don't often um, think of in, in, the, in, in our Methodist tradition. In, in this moment where the proposal that you're, you're aligning with is this uh, two, uh, proposal for a two-year interim bishops, and there's another proposal too, so we'll see what happens at the mm -hmm. General Conference. I'm, I'm a delegate from the Mississippi West Tennessee Conference, and even in our delegation meeting, there's interesting conversations happening there about that. Mm -hmm. But if it does happen, I think we have a good example in what's happened with Bishops Webb and Jones. Right. And it's it, there's all, as I've observed them and as I've participated in various or attended various annual conferences outside of my own, it's interesting to see people having to adjust what they think a bishop is supposed to do. And I think they've been a good, they've given us a good start with that, but this is gonna be a key time in these two years to help redefine what a bishop is. A bishop, it, it, right. it, if this proposal goes through, I want to be very clear, if that proposal goes through, um, th this is a time to like say, no, no, bishops have a different focus. So when this hap if this happens, what do you feel the Assembly of Bishops should focus on in this interim period? And, and, and that's to just assume that happens to set the stage for full-time bishops in 2026. So what would happen in these two years and what do you think should happen? Well, I, th I think you're exactly right that these two years are critical and we have the opportunity in these two years to set DNA. Mm. So my my hope would be that those chosen for the role of a general episcopacy, should that happen, use that time almost like a, a laboratory experience, working in, in real time, which is what Bishops Jones and Webb have done. They've worked in real time. They've worked in, in within annual congresses, but also uh, with the TLC, with the denomination as a whole, as it has begun to form, they have tried to figure out what works and what doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so I think that if we expand that general episcopacy pool to eight, um, which is the proposal, then those eight should work together to become unified. First of all, to really develop a um, over time to develop a very Chris, uh, a clear and crisp job description for, for Bishop to really think together about what spiritual gifts are best operative in that yes. role yes. so that we can, when we're, when we're talking to somebody about whether or not they should be Bishop, we're really not asking, do you aspire to the role or, you know, do you have a better campaign than everybody else? Not at all. Right. Do you have the gifts for this? And if not, right. why in the world would you want to serve here? Right now? Then, you know, yeah. so um, so we're really thinking I would think that that would be the main role is that we serve as a laboratory while we serve the church, while we do the things that need to be done, the ordinations, the the travel, the teaching, the um, the the um, coordination as districts and conferences and churches continue to funnel into the GMC. We're also constantly at work shaping that role of the bishop because as as the leadership goes so goes the denomination i'm i'm sure of it yeah for sure yeah and and again we i just want to acknowledge okay i hope that even just the fact that we're doing this this was this was one of the one of the two main plans was happening it could be that there's a different model that's uh accepted by general conference so i just want to acknowledge that here that there's different legislation is that is that correct am i am i saying that all there are there are two uh, legislative pieces being considered. Yes. Okay. Yes, and I and I understand your need to be um, to be uh, non nonpartisan. Is that the right <laughs> word? As you're as we're discussing those, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but 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 with thanks for um, also the spirit that I've seen of of uh, people other people while there are differences and. I did have to look through as a delegate. I didn't know this necessarily when I accepted it. I'm one of these rare people, Carolyn, who wasn't UMC, who's now in the GMC. So maybe some others when I, I, I accepted the opportunity, when I was presented with the opportunity to apply and um, became a, 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 a delegate, I didn't know I was going to have close to 700 peti petitions to read. 
So, uh, <laughs> but anyways, I'm, I, I did it and I'm working through it. And I can sense though, even in our delegation, just a, a real a, a, a openness, a spirit of charity. So I'm hopeful that that's what will be a part of the general conference. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on yeah. to another question. I wanna say two oh, things go ahead, about go ahead. that. Just, just as the, if, if, if your listeners hear nothing else I say today, I would say this, that especially for delegates, my prayer for you as you come into that amazing celebration that will be Costa Rica's convening conference. Yes. Is that you come bringing a spirit of trust and a, and a good sense of humor. Amen. I've been doing this for long enough to be able to say to anyone who's who's just now coming into these these positions of um, of decision making that it, it really does take a flexible spirit. What we say today may, you know, when it doesn't work, we all need to be able to go, well, that was an excellent mistake. Let's move on and try something different. Um, but a good sense of humor will take you a long way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I sense that there is a willingness for people to embrace that sense of humor. And I'm looking yeah. forward, looking oh, forward to that. Jesus. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, we talk about and you talk about your own gifts uh, be fitting with what this proposal is for an interim bishop. And one of those areas of uh, being a teacher is is key for folks, all of us who are try having to work through some key understanding of doctrine. But how do you understand the inspiration and authority of scripture? And why is this important for us at this phase? It's everything. It's why we're here, really, mm -hmm. because we do understand scripture as being the, the we are people. We as Methodists are people of one book. Mm -hmm. So. The Bible is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The, the Bible is inspired by God. Every word in is 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 true. We, every word of the scripture carries truth. And it is God's um it is a story of God. It gives us an, a clear understanding of God's character. He is loving, he is for us, he is full of grace, he can be trusted. And it also is God's, um, uh, he, he shows us our design, which is so important. When I know how I'm designed and I live within that design, now I am living the best possible life. Yes, and the scripture yes. is, my, is my basis for understanding my design as, a, as, a, as one created by God the Father, given uh, salvation through Jesus Christ, his son, inspired with life by the Holy Spirit himself. Amen. So Are you comfortable with the language of inerrancy? I believe the Bible is inerrant in its original form. Yes. Amen. Okay. Yeah. I just like, I, and, I, and I'm open to, um, I've never been one to suggest, even though our school has historically affirmed inerrancy, according to the Chicago statement on inerrancy, but I haven't been one to um, say that this has to be part of the GMC. I'm just hopeful that people in yeah. GMC are comfortable with people who oh, have inerrancy. That's my point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is enough in the Bible to last lifetimes. I mean, the Bible itself says if, it was, if everything that is contained in the life of Jesus Christ were, it would it would to take more paper than there is paper in the world. And there are trees to make the paper to say all of it. And so the Bible is enough. That's what I would say. For me, Amen. the Bible is enough. And, okay. and here's here, to take it one step further, I, I would say that the, um, the, the, the Bible, the reason the Bible is enough is it points me to Jesus, Amen. who is Lord. It gives me the most ancient of creeds that Jesus mm -hmm. is Lord. And when I understand that Jesus is Lord and that that um, that my my whole life has to fall under that lordship, everything. Mm -hmm. has to fall under that lordship. Then I begin to understand what the good life is. Amen. And I, and I think in general, this uh, affirming everything you just said helps us as we become a global movement that is connected to other traditions. And I just think of even the language that's in the Luzon Covenant, that the Bible is without error and all it affirms and what that's trying to say is helpful to us, even in just making, because, you know, Carolyn, I've been in some environments where some people are still suspicious because what they think, where maybe happened to be where they lived, maybe what region of the of the United States they live in, when they hear the word Methodist, they don't think of, of people who affirm the authority 
or the reliability of the scripture. So that's that's in part, I think, why I think this is some, um, something yeah. that I, we like to highlight at WBS. One of the things, Carolyn, is that we need to be thinking about things we can capitalize on in this moment. And I think there probably are things that we as a church need to unlearn in order to be the people God has called us to be. But there's probably some things, too, we need to learn. So what would you think some of those things we need to unlearn are and what, what do we need to learn? Well, I would start. I'm going to start to sound like a broken record now. Okay. I would start by saying that we need to unlearn what it means to be an Episcopal leader, um, to, to uh, thinking not as administrator or excellent politician um, uh, or, or even as pastor to the whole church, but as apostle and prophet, um, as, as evangelist, helping us to stretch our tent peg, pegs as far as Methodism can stretch around the world. Um, so that's where I would start. We need to unlearn that. I think we also need to unlearn the role of, of any kind of spiritual leader as all around bad guy. We are complicit mm. in building a culture where we distrust those in leadership. And to the extent that any one of us immediately senses distrust in the leadership of, a, of an organization that we have voluntarily joined, <laughs> the world is yes. full of denominations. If you've joined this one, I hope you've joined it because you trust those who are helping, who are serving to make it. Wow. Uh, to, 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 to advance it. But if you've, if you've got an element of distress, then that's an area of repentance that needs mm. to be dealt with. Um, and I think we also need to unlearn the idea that we are constrained by what we've known. I mentioned this earlier that um, we don't, we're not constrained in the global Methodist church by only those areas of the world where we have where we served in the denomination we all lived in formally. We, the whole world is our pa parish. Amen. That's a Amen. very Wesleyan thing to say. So can we dream together about, about where we might plant churches, about where we might send Amen. missionaries and evangelists, about where we might extend our tent pegs, about where we might build formal partnerships with those who are already on the ground in places where we aren't yet. Amen. Yeah. And th that connects with this next question, which again, connects to the emphasis you already had in this interview about evangelism, but there are mm -hmm. approximately 3 billion people in the world who have no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how would you in this role, even though it's just two years, give voice to the crisis, this crisis and mobilize local churches, which make up the GMC to be responsive to that crisis? Yeah, I, I think we just need to develop. A, 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 we've been we've all been through a really hard time between mm -hmm. disaffiliation and the pandemic. The last five years have just been tough on everybody. And our sense of travel and adventure has been has has shifted in those years. Uh, so but I the, the world is safe again to uh, you know most parts of it are safe as safe as it is for any Christian. I'll say that. Um, to travel in, and we need to reimagine what missions can look like. Yes. Um, we need to we 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 definitely need to develop a new emphasis and a job description for an evangelist in our new mm. movement. Yes, and we need to look at things like I mean, just think of India, just India. E. Stanley Jones served yes. as an evangelist and missionary in India for years, um, and there there is a Methodist presence in India. But what would it look like to bring spirit-filled Methodism to India and to partner with those who are already on the ground there, to, to offer training, to, to partner even with organizations like ILI, Peter Pereira's group. Um, mm -hmm. the, so, so there's just so many opportunities to stretch our to stretch our tent. Yeah. And yeah, this to stretch it evangelistically. We need to sort of probably find a new way to think of, of just stretching ourselves to the ends of the earth. Yes. Yeah. One of the challenges I think can be for some churches who might have had um, a great disaffiliation vote, maybe they had 99% or something, is to the real, not take advantage of the opportunity to expand our horizons in this moment. Like, okay, oh. yeah, we're thankful not, not to not have to have uh, apportionments. We're thankful to have, be aligned with scripture. But also, this is an opportunity to say, this is a fresh start for us. That includes the way we respond evangelistically to whom much is ex uh, to, to whom much is given much is expected absolutely carolyn 
one of the things that I think is important for us, and, and this is something we want to emphasize at Wesley Biblical Seminary too, is we realize that we're a part of this um, classic evangelical world. And, and in that community, there's there often hasn't, I don't believe, been the accent or the, the flavoring from the Wesleyan world. Um, what do you believe the Global Methodist Church can be to the broader classically evangelical world? I think what we have to offer, the, 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 I've thought about this a lot. What it, all right, so we've already talked about the fact that Methodism's great contribution to the body of Christ is its emphasis on entire sanctification. But within that Methodist world, there, and there's lots of Methodist, uh, there, there are lots of denominations with a Wesleyan root to them. Yes. But, so within that Wesleyan world, what can the GMC offer specifically? And I believe that spirit-filled Methodism. I believe we have a real opportunity to emphasize the person and work of the Holy Spirit yes. to become in the best, most winsome uh, way of thinking about it, charismatic Methodist, Amen. to believe Amen. that the work that Jesus sent his first followers out to do, when he sent them out, the very first missionaries to cast out demons, cure diseases, proclaim the kingdom, and heal the sick, that that is available to us too. Methodists are not cessationists, although we often uh, operate as practical cessationists. There you go. But we yes. believe that the Holy Spirit is alive and active in the church. And, that, and, and so how are we acting as if that is true? And, and what I have found is as I have traveled around teaching just very simple tools for introducing the person and work into the life of the church is that people are hungry for it. In fact, I think that's kind of, it feels to me like that's a leading edge as people have been released like calves from the stall into the global Methodist church, the thing that most excites them is the idea of exploring the spirit filled life. And so I say, let's do it. Let's, Amen. Amen. let's become audacious optimists who love and live and flow in the personal work of the Holy spirit and, and uh, see what kind of healing we can bring into the world. You know, as we've been in these environments where there are various groups, and this will lead into the next question, um, other seminaries and, and universities, Bible colleges and the like, that um, they've come to us. So we have, well, we've had oh, more than 500 global Methodist church pastors come through our doors, even if that's digitally over the last year and a half. We have mm -hmm. right now close to 400 students in classes with us at WBS. But pe so people have come to me and said, hey, how do I get in the GMC game, so to speak? And um, and so as we've been at these conferences and there've been other schools present, one of our professors was representing us there and another school from another theological tradition, we'll just say that, and we came up to him and said, so tell me, what is this? What 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 is Wesleyan? Is <laughs> and so our professor, and you can, if you all, he just preached a sermon, you can find on our podcast, The Biblical Wesleyan, that is um, a, a chapel podcast where he um, just talked about the Holy Spirit problem that evangelicalism has. And so he, he said, he just basically outlined what you just said, this uh, focus on sanctification by the work of the spirit. And this other school said, well, we don't, we don't talk about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's not really well you might not be a good fit for the gmc that's kind of what we that's wanted to right. say but, um, because we are a trinitarian uh theology we have a trinitarian theology we, we seems like we've forgotten that um but my goodness if, if you believe in entire sanctification you cannot go too far down that trajectory without running into the holy spirit Amen. Amen. Absolutely. And so that kind of fits in just being aware of people who are wanting to serve the church and see an opportunity. And I don't I don't criticize other institutions for that. Can you talk to me about theological education? I can't help but get this in. This probably isn't even necessarily something a bishop would have to work with. But I just want your opinion while I have you, Carolyn, to think about theological education in the GMC. What should it look like? Who should mm -hmm. offer it? There's some mm -hmm. legislation about this, but I'd just love to hear your thoughts. Well, I, let me just say, let me broaden that just a little bit to say that one great opportunity we have in the Global Methodist Church is to shake off that notion that we have to, we have to create the institutions that serve yes. the denomination. 
So we know we don't have to create the seminaries. We don't have to create the mission organizations. Yes. We don't have to create the, the, the parachurch ministries that serve. We can partner with those that already exist. And that's part of how we can keep our movement lean and mean and keep the dollars in the local church. Yes. So having said that, when I think about seminaries, that gives us this wonderful opportunity to go find those seminaries that are theologically aligned, mm -hmm. develop uh, partnerships with them. And at what point they no longer theologically align with us, we set them free to do whatever it is they're doing that they feel called by God to do. And that's just so much easier yes. than owning a thing. And, uh, you, you know, you just you don't have to own everything in order <laughs> to benefit from its goodness. Amen. That sounds great. Obviously, it sounds great to me because I'm serving in a seminary that's like that. But at the same time, I think it's a good model, particularly when you look what's happened in other denominations, the way that some of that institutionalism has crept in. Um, large endowments have led it so the faculty and the seminary aren't as accountable to the church. Um, that's why our approach at WBS has been, well, we're going to look at what the Transitional Book of Discipline says, and we're going to model our program on that. We're not going to tell the GMC, you need to have a program like this. We're going we're gonna to listen to the church and try to be responsive. To, and you know what? It could come to the day, I don't think it will be there, where the GMC could say, you know, you're not doing what we want, so we're not going to partner with you. And I think that's a right. healthy place to be for everybody. Yeah, yeah. It gives us, it just gives us a much greater flexibility and, 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 and much gra greater opportunity to hold everything that we partner with with an open hand. We're not going to dictate who you or your seminary become, we're simply going to say, well, you know, we'll partner with you to the extent that it benefits both of us. And to the extent that it doesn't move on with your lives. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we move on and, and, and be who God's called us to be. But I, I, I don't think that's the future for WBS and the GMC. And we're so thankful yeah. for what's happening in this exciting moment. Carolyn, I'll just give you another minute. If there's anything else you'd like to say, um, I'd love if anything that I didn't emphasize that you'd like to add. I, I appreciate the emphases that, that came through, and I, I certainly am invigorated as a result of that. But anything else you'd like to say? Here's where I would like to end. In the last year, I've spoken at, I think, somewhere eight to 10, I can't remember the number now, of annual conferences, some convening annual conferences of the Global Methodist Church, some are in their second year. I have yet to be in a room full of Global Methodists who weren't absolutely giddy about the future. Yeah. So much joy, so much excitement. I have loved the emphasis on worship that we've that we've that we've taken for our global gatherings, uh, I mean our 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 combined gatherings. I've gotten very excited to see how deep people are going into the work of prayer, um, how excited they are about the person and work of the Holy Spirit, how excited they are to dream together. And I hope that that same, that same joy, that same enthusiasm, that same spirit of celebration can find us at, in Costa Rica as we join together to do this new thing. I am so excited to get started. Yeah, Amen. let's let Pentecost catch up with us, folks. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you there, Carolyn. Thanks so much for your time today. Well, hi, friends. I'm glad you've come along. You heard me say at the beginning of the podcast that this was sponsored by True Charity. And I'm delighted to have Bethany Heron here to tell me a little bit more about this wonderful ministry I think could be a very important part of the way your church can serve its community. Bethany, tell me, tell us a little bit more about True Charity. Hey guys, my name is Bethany. I am the Vice President of Education over at True Charity. Uh, about 20 years ago, we started out of a rescue mission in Joplin, Missouri. And what was realized early on in that rescue mission is that typical handout models, it, it wasn't really effective. Um, our CEO and founder, he and his wife started this ministry. And what they realized is that as people were coming through, that there was a bit of embarrassment on their face. Um, there was not dignity in what they were doing and they felt like something was off. And so they, they took a step back and they reevaluated their ministry and transitioned to a more relational exchange model of ministry. And it was messier because relationships, yeah. as you and I know, are messy, but they were pretty, pretty sure that it was more biblical. And, you know, yeah. they read some books, they looked at God's word and this is, this is what they were convicted to do. 
And so they moved towards this relational ministry where people were invited to be a part of their own solution, uh, where God's people were invited to mentor and build relationships with people in poverty. And even though they were serving less people, serving less mouths, uh, they were actually seeing greater changes in the lives of those that they served and people were actually becoming free from poverty. So they made this change and as they did, and they made this change in their own ministry, other organizations around their community were starting to ask about the changes, like how is your organization, how is your rescue mission actually leading people to freedom from poverty? What are you doing? What, how is this working? And so they started sharing. And this is what brings us to true charity today and who we are today. We are a nationwide network sharing similar practice, helping organizations implement similar models of relational, dignifying, holistic developmental ministry in their own settings. We have 209 churches and nonprofits around the United States who are moving towards this North Star of biblical, effective ministry. So how is it then that you partner with churches? Like, what is it that you do with churches? Um, There's one story in scripture that I like to go back to time and time again. And it's where this beggar is asking Peter for money. And Peter's response is not to give him money, but instead he actually steps back and he says, well, silver and gold, I do not have, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth walk. And we can implement a very, very similar model within our own organizations. And that's what we try and do at True Charity. We want to get to the root cause that truly frees someone from poverty. I can only imagine that that beggar, now that he can walk, is no longer a beggar. He's able to go and provide for his own family. And he has the dignity of living as God has intended for him to. And so with that type of Uh, theory in mind that we want to get to the root cause and treat people as individuals made in God's image with dignity and respect, we build our programs. So we all agree that it's important to teach a man to fish, but it's hard to develop the programs that build off that theory. And so that's what we do. Our, Our 209 network members around the United States, they share their best practice with our team and our team takes that and develops training to, for other organizations to use to prayerfully implement similar models. This sponsorship for you coming on this podcast comes in the context of the Global Methodist Church, though uh, many other listeners to this podcast beyond just that tradition, but they have a real opportunity. And so I'm just interested in why are you interested in working with the Global Methodist Church? God is doing something special in the Global Methodist. He has position the global Methodists at the start of something new, that this is an opportunity to stop and look back and to evaluate the outcomes of yes. their charitable practice. Um, this is just a new opportunity to live out gospel-centered community development through the local church. The church has been called to bring restoration. Amen. And I I believe that the global Methodist church, God has positioned them to live out this call to bring restoration in their communities in new and exciting ways. Beautiful. That's exactly what we want to see happen. So I'm thankful for partners like you that want to come alongside churches and at this really critical time. Uh, Tell us where they can find more out about your ministry. You can find it in my show notes, but also just tell us here so they make sure they can hear it. Absolutely. Uh, If you want want to know more about True Charity, you can visit truecharity.us and we have all the information on there about our resources, about our membership. You can view a map where our members are located to see if you have any network members near you. Anything that you need can be found on truecharity.us.